tick tock, tick, 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 tick. If I kept on doing that, that would probably burrow in your mind, right? That's that sound somehow kind of pierces your heart. Tick, tick, tick. And you, if you pair it with a clock or a countdown, it also changes how you feel, how you react. Maybe for a runner, that countdown will spur a motivation to just push further, to get the extra burst of energy. As you hear that tick tock, and as a test taker, it increases your, the pressure to answer that question and to not waste time. Maybe for a student at the end of the year, you look at the clock, tick tock, and it generates this excitement and anticipation for summer break. If you're on a bomb squad, that tick tock will make things you know, urgent to defuse the deton detonator. And for a preacher, perhaps that tick tock will force more clarity to quicken the pace to get to the point. The point is, that's time. We cannot escape time. And we live often in a race against time. And time is not stagnant. It is moving with momentum. And it, like we see, it impacts our emotions, our actions, our motivations. But where we are in that timeline, where we are in that countdown, influences the significance, doesn't it, exponentially. If you're 60 seconds left, it's a lot different than three seconds left. If you have six months left to live, it's a lot different and more impactful than if you had six years. When you're closer to the end, it brings a greater awareness. It brings a, a profound sensitivity and urgency to the situation. And we know that time is ticking for all of us. We don't know when our time, our clock will stop. It is not our timing, but we know that it's God's. It's His time and His program and His countdown. How would you live if you had an hour to live? You probably act more intentionally. Your priorities likely will change and you maybe hold loved ones more dearly, cherish those moments. What if God tells us this is the last hour? How should we live? How should we respond if we see that time is clicking, ticking closer to the end? And that is what we're going to hear today. It is the last hour, and time is ticking, and it's ticking closer and closer to the end. And so if you look at your outline here in, uh, in the program, you see that time is ticking for the world. And there's two main points in our section in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 to 24, that the time is now. And we see that through verse 18 to 21, talking about the last hour, the Antichrists are here. And we'll explain what that means and who that is. But what, what about the Antichrist? Well, they're here. They're here ahead of the Antichrist, as we'll learn. And they're here not somewhere outside. It's from the church itself. But how do we live in response to this urgent time that those that are anointed will expose the Antichrist and understand who they are because they know the truth? So that's the first section that we'll see. And the second is in from verse 22 to 24. John asks, who is the, the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? And what he's talking about is the content of what is taught. And the deceit is not just in their methods, but in the actual doctrine that they teach. So the Antichrist are liars. And what do they lie about? They lie about the person and work of Jesus Christ. They lie about the character and plan of God, as it says, if you deny the Son, you deny the Father as well. But how do you expose that truth? How do you expose, I'm sorry, how to expose the lies is when you hold on and abide in the gospel truth. So this is the last hour. This is the clock ticking. How will we respond? Let us pray and come to his word. God, we... 
come to you, Lord, as our sovereign ruler, as we heard. You will come and you will reign. We in, we, for those that are yours, Lord, we long for that day and we eagerly anticipate it. We don't know how long that will be, but it's close. We see the signs of the times. We see the evidences of the clock ticking closer and closer. But Lord, help us to live differently, knowing that. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to sense the urgency. And help us to cling to you more closely and dearly. And help us to live intentionally for your glory as we go forward. Open our ears, quicken our heart, and allow us to respond to you for your pleasure and glory. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. So let's talk about the time is ticking for the world. And if you, if, if in your Bibles, just turn to the context that we see here in verse 15 to 17. From the last time, if you remember, that, he, that John is talking to this, those, those that he loves, and he's saying, you know, the, the children, the, the little children, the family of God, the mature ones, the young ones, I want you to remind you of who you are in Christ, that you are in him, that you know him, you know him from the beginning, and you, you have victory in him. But he's saying, after he affirms who they are, he warns them and says, don't fall in love with the world. Don't fall in love with the world system, the values of this world, the things that are espoused on social media and trending and maybe even viral and popularized and embraced by the world system and saying, this is what it's about. And you might be tempted. You might be seduced to join the flow, to, to ride this wave. But he's saying this wave will stop this flow and this wave will crash. All of its craving, its longings, its passions its lust, its values will go down. And it's at the end of verse 17, it says, the world is passing away and also its lust. And if you remember, he talks about the lust of the flesh, which is equivalent, if we use our colloquial terms, is do what feels good. Do what feels right to you. Do what, what, what makes sense to you. Do you do you. And I, that's, that's what you're about. Just do you. And that's, that's the values that are, are being taught and being and being uh, celebrated and it says that kind of attitude that lust of the flesh will will pass away get what you want that attitude of the lust of the eyes you see it go get it that's the that's the that's the principles the values that we've heard since childhood in school and all of that that to get what you want you deserve what you want go get it the lust of the eyes, and then the last thing he talks about is the pride of life. It's your life. It's your rights. Do it your way. I mean, that all those three components are the values of this world, the cravings, and, and John is saying, don't get seduced by that, thinking that it's going to last. It's not going to last. It will come to an end. It is passing away, and also it's lust. So you might think, hey, satisfy my feelings, do what feels right. Yes, you might satisfy for a time, but it will not ultimately satisfy. You get what you want, you'll always want more. And it'll be a vapor in the end. And in the end, you'll realize, you think it's your life, you'll see that it's not your life. You did not make yourself come into the world, and you cannot take yourself out. It is not your life. It is not your own. You belong to your Creator, and who's made in His image. And you will realize that at the end, when all is passing away, but the one who does the will of God, who is in line with the values and, and principles that he's talking about, that he reveals in his word, will live forever. So John is saying, tick, talk, tick, talk, the world is passing away. And then he's in that light of that context that the, the world is passing away. In verse 18, he turns, it says, children... Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you, do you know what it means? It's saying, he's saying, children, beloved, with this love and tenderness of a father, he's saying, listen to me. It is the last hour. This passing away is not passing away long down the road in many years. It is the final countdown. It is the last days. 
And as they hear this word, last hour, it's, it would trigger for those that are in the early church that they're talking about the last part of God's program. From the first, uh, the, the time from when Christ came, when he first comes in, in the incarnation and in, 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 in crucifixion and resurrection till the time of his second coming. It is the last hour talking about the last 10 minutes, 30 minutes. We don't know how long that will be, but whatever it is, it is the last days. And what he's saying to us and to the early church here is the time is right now. The time is at hand. You are in the last hour and time is ticking. And he says, how do you know? How do you know that you're in the last hour? He says, well, you know, just, just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. He's almost like Paul Revere saying, the Antichrists are here, the Antichrists are here. They, they are here. You've got to wake up. You've got to get with it. Don't just be in your slumber. It is happening now. And he's saying, get up, see it. Be on the alert. And so that's what he's saying to us and saying to us is that the Antichrist are here. Children, it is the last hour and just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. And who are they here? We see that they're here ahead of the Antichrist. So you might hear this and you're like, what is, I know who Christ is, what is Antichrist? You know, what, what is that, why use that term? And you think, yeah, why, John? Why, do you, why don't you use false teachers? Why don't you, that Jesus even used false Christ and false prophets. He uses anti-Christ. And actually, in the New Testament, this, is, this words are only used four times. And it's all used by John. Three times in 1 John, one time in 2 John. And so he coins this term. And the word here, it says anti, as we know, is against or in opposition to Christ. But it also means to replace, to be instead of. So instead of Christ, in place of Christ. And what he's saying here, and he, I think he's emphasizing, is not just that they're, they're error in secondary matters or just like these, they're kind of off on this. No, the result of their life and teaching replaces Christ. Replaces Christ with something else, someone else, and that is in opposition to Christ. And what we have to be careful is, once we hear that kind of, you know, you guys probably know that Tan Taylor Swift song, you know, anti-hero, there's a hero and anti-hero, right? Like, there's, oh yeah, he, he's just, he's just a, the counterpart of the hero, but he still has some, you know, redeeming qualities. No, it is not just a counterpart to Christ. It is not just Christ and anti-Christ, and it's just like Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, like to yin and yang. No, it's not that. It is not just, you know, it is the opposite, not just opposite, but against and replacing Christ. It is Christ and Antichrist. Like, it's totally not on the equivalent playing field. And what he's saying here also is that it's subtle and subversive. You know, you don't come to a church or a, a, leader, a, 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 a gathering and they have a business card saying, you know, I'm Antichrist. Hello, my name is Antichrist Al. Welcome to my Antichrist church. It, it, don't, it is not as overt as that. And so it is what they claim to teach Christ. They claim to even know Christ. They claim to even love Christ. But yet, what in reality, they replace and oppose Christ. I mean, that's what he's saying here, saying, you think that this is coming in the future. It is already here. This kind of philosophy, this kind of leadership, this kind of teaching is here. And so when he says, um, just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, he says Antichrist, not as in terms of in the plural, but in the singular that there is one Antichrist, and this person is a singular person. It's not a philosophy or principle or you know, symbol. It is a singular person that personifies and embodies 
this deception and denial of Jesus Christ, and it will happen in the final days. This was prophesied and predicted in the Old Testament and confirmed in the New Testament and talk about the final struggle between the forces of God and the forces of Satan to again will culminate in the, in, in the end, end time when, the, uh, when, when a human leader will arise. He will be empowered and energized by Satan. He will be politically powerful. You know, unify the world under one global system and one perhaps even military. Be able to influence things economically have one currency, you know, maybe Bitcoin or whatever it will be, but, but there will be an exchange that will happen that universally. And he's charismatic. Socially, they, 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 he, has, he has a silver tongue. He, he speaks with, such, which, with, with articulation and, and convincing and moving in his speech. And then he's cunning that many even in the church will be deceived. And he will exalt himself as the world's savior, to be revered and worshipped, to set his sights, then to persecute those that turn against him and claim to worship the true Christ in Jesus. In this period of time, the Bible terms as the tribulation, a time of seven years. And he's so convincing of an order, so, so charismatic that he convinces Israel that he will be you know, he will bring peace to Israel. The, in the peace in the Middle East that has been in turmoil for all, of, all the history that we've known. And he'll make a pact with Israel and bring peace to them. And in the middle of those years, three and a half years, he will turn on his pact and turn and on Israel, attack them, set up rule, and mobilize the world against all that follow Christ. And, and I, will, I will go over this, but what he's saying is that you've heard this. It's not a new concept. This is what the early church have heard and are familiar with and understood the prophecy. And I'm just going to, for, for, for all of us just to remind ourselves of the Antichrist, I want you to kind of capture and just bear with me as I kind of walk you through, you know, obviously this is not a study in the full aspect of the Antichrist, but understand what the first church would have heard, uh, you know, part of what they've heard. And if you kind of, the Antichrist is, is not just expressed in those terms, but also synonyms to that, like the man of lawlessness, like the man of sin, and the imagery of a little horn, like on, the, on a beast, in the, in the beast itself. And so if you have your Bibles, and I have the references on screen just to follow as well, we first look at the prophecy in Daniel. Daniel 7 verse 24 to 25. He's talking, you know, the, if, you have, if you ever want to, you know, have a, a good read about, the, about the, the end times, Daniel 7 uh, and on 4 to 13 is, is good in, in terms of understanding that. But what he will be is this little horn of the beast. In verse 24 and 25, it talks about that. As for the ten horns, each one is a king. And out of his, this kingdom, ten kings will arise and another will arise after them. And he will be different from the previous ones and subdue three kings and he will speak out against the most high and wear down the saints of the highest one and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law and they will be given into his hand for a time times and a half a time there the time is the the years three and a half years so again he'll speak against god and then persecute his people then you go forward to Daniel 8, verses 23 to 25, talking about the reign of terror, this, this, how he will act towards the people of God from Daniel 8, uh, 23 to 25. It talks about the latter period of rule when the transgressors have run their course. A king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will, he will destroy mighty men and the holy people, and through his shrewdness he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence, and he will magnify himself in his heart, and he will destroy many they are at ease, while they are at ease, and he will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. 
Obviously, there's a lot here, but you see that he's persecuting, he's influential, and that he's empowered, as we'll see, by Satan. That is not by his own power, but behind him is the power of Satan, bent on destruction, bent to destroy and bring even opposition to the prince of peace and prince of all, of Jesus Christ. And then if you look at Daniel 9, Verse 24 to 26, we know the timeline here. If you remember our previous discussions about the 70 weeks, that each week talks about in terms of years, and it talks about the, the years that are, are in the program of God from when the, the temple was established to, if we remember, when, he, when Jesus went into the, uh, the, the triumphal entry. It happened on that exact day at that exact time. That's, this is the program that he's talking about. And here in Daniel, he's saying that the Antichrist is the last part of the last part of this program. Verse 24 to 26, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end to sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks it will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. That's the crucifixion predicted and have nothing. And the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary and its end will come with the flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. So you see that we already see that the, the Messiah was cut off and have nothing. And then so the next part of this program is from this last hour, this last time. Of, and we see during this, the prince will come and destroy the sanctuary. And the desolations will become as well. The acts of desolation and then there's an act of desolation that Jesus brings into view and warns the disciples of this last hour and in Matthew 24 it talks about this as well he says for many will come in my name Jesus is saying this saying I am the Christ and will mislead many you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars see that you are not frightened for those things must take place and that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of the birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Verse 12 of chapter 24 because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the world, whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. And here, look in verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Basically, what Jesus is saying is there's going to be an act of abomination. You think about what, uh, what does the word abomination mean? It's, it's this act that's so detestable and shameful before God. And he says, abomination of desolation represents a barrenness and an emptiness. There's going to be an act that kind of embodies that, that is so blasphemous that it will happen and basically re, the, the Antichrist will act on this and in the temple replace God, oppose God as the center of worship and exaltation. We don't know exactly the details of what that entails, but what you can sense is it is totally depraved and in blasphemy and shameful before God. And if you look at 2 Thessalonians, not just 
you know, we heard Daniel talk about it, Jesus talked about it, and so this is what the first church has already heard. And Paul will talk about it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 to 12. And it says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not th- remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things, and you know that you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains will do so until he is taken away. Then that lawlessness, lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring by the, by, to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one who is coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluded influence so that they will believe what is false, in order that they all would may judge who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. So I know there's a lot there. If you're able to follow on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, just write that down. But basically, he's talking about the man of lawlessness. Someone who lives as if there's no moral law, there's no standard of which there is. He represents a life that's lawless, of, of the values of doing what you want, doing you know, how you think, you'd establish that law. So he established, that, that is what he represents. And he will deceive many. And many even that claim to be Christian, believe in God, and, and it will reveal that they did not love the truth. They, the pleasure and living and the worldliness of sin is the grip that holds them. And so this is what, this is what the, the first church heard. They heard about from Daniel. They heard from Jesus. They would hear, hear this from Paul and say, you heard that the Antichrist is coming. You heard what he represents, what he comes to do, that he's there to replace God, stand in opposition to God, and he's there in a way that will, will, will defame him. And he, guess what? It's already begun. There are many Antichrists with the same kind of spirit, with the same values, with the same teachings, with the same principles, with the same power behind it, and the same results. It's already happening, and there are many all around you. And even in the first church, they have already seen the fulfillment of that in different aspects. The, the ruler in Daniel that's pr- predicted was fulfilled in a, in a ruler called Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And he actually set up uh, you know, uh, uh, worship of him in the temple. And then some thought it would be Nero as he persecuted the church. And we can see that even in our time in history. Hitler, who claimed to have even on Christian principles to go establish a race superior and annihilate all others that oppose him. And others along the way, not just that show shades of the Antichrist, they're already here. And not just one, but many and all around in our midst. And even what Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24, he said, there will be some that they will say that I am the Christ. I am the Savior. This is the way. And it will sound right. It will sound logical. It will sound convincing. It will sound that they are of Christ. But they are not of Christ. They are Antichrist. They claim to be of Christ, but they're replacing Christ. They're actually standing against Christ. And you have to realize this, children, is what John's saying, that you are in it now. And you you and I are in this last hour. And and where are they? Are they, you know, out in the world, in, 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 in culture and society? No, where are they coming from? And he says... They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. They were, they went out from us, meaning 
they were in with us. So they were out of the church. They were out from us, of this community, of this flock, and it says they were part or claiming to be part of the body of Christ, all in the church as, as, a, as, a, as a whole. And what does that mean? That means that those that, these antichrists, which are teachers and leaders, they know the gospel. They know the terminology. They know the teachings. They know the principles. They may be, haven't even been raised in the church. Cultural Christianity, understanding the values, even maybe profess Christ, but not possess Christ, claim Christ, but are not in Him. And they are now, even in your Christian bookstores, on, on Christian media, Christian TikTok, whatever it is, Sunday schools, life groups, even in some in pulpits, some elders. It's in the books you may be reading, the influencers you may be following, the sermons you may be hearing. They came out from us. They are out of the church. So how can you tell then? How can you tell who are of Christ and who are anti-Christ? And John will delineate three characteristics. You can tell because of the three, I would say, three Ds. They will depart, they will deny, and they will deceive. Verse two, chapter 2, verse 19 says, They will depart from the body. Because it says, They were of us, but they went out, so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. So they depart from the body. And then this, the second we'll address a little later is in chapter, uh, verse 22, that they will deny. They will deny Christ as the Savior, Jesus as the Savior. And lastly, they will deceive, verse, chapter, verse 26, that those that have written to you who are trying to deceive you. So let's look at the first, that they depart from the body, they will defect from the church. It says, they went out from us. It's talking about separation from the fellowship of the body, not in particular maybe a local church, but the fellowship of the faith. But what does it show? That they are not really of us. So they break away because they are not really of us. They show their true condition in their defection. Their teaching and beliefs and values get to the point where they're not in line with the biblical gospel. And it cannot be sustained. It cannot be compatible that there will come a breaking point where they will depart from the orthodoxy, the sound doctrine that has been taught in scriptures, and they will say, you must follow me. And what they do is they introduce new teachings, new revelation, new knowledge, that if you want to know God deeper, you got to follow me because this new revelation has been done. Don't follow this old, stale gospel. This, you know, it's old school, man. This is the new way. This is, new, this is the secret knowledge that I can give to you if you follow me. That's the, the attitude here. And back then, if you remember, this, the, the culture of... Uh, the false teachers was called the Gnostics. You know, this, that, that if you wanted to know, you know the God deeper, you have to have this special revelation, this secret knowledge of God. And if you think that's something that just happened in the first church, it's happening today. That God's speaking to me and revealing new knowledge and of, of the new church and of a new calling, and you, you need to, to click on this. You need to hear this. You think about Joseph Smith, he, how he founded the, the Mormon church, that he received from the angel a new, a new knowledge that, G, that God wanted a new church. And this new church is the Mormon church. Or even Ellen White, with the Seventh-day Adventist, talking about, I have new revelation that he's given to, spoken to me, and I put it down in writing. And one of the most popular books that I see, like I told you before, in, in nursing homes, is the, the book called Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. And what she's saying is that Jesus, I'm writing the word that Jesus spoke to me to bless you. And people are, it's best-selling. And others along the way talking about, I have new revelation. I have new things that are being seen, and only I have access to that. And if you... Follow me and, and, and listen and under my teaching, I can pass that on to you. 
And that is, and that, that cannot be sustained in the biblical in the biblical church because that is not how God set it up. And so there will be a breaking point where you say, you know, don't follow this old way. There's a new way. And, and Jesus spoke about this kind of in a parable in Matthew 13 about the wheat and the tares that you can't tell. And I looked up what, you know, I, I'm not a farmer, so I look at what is, what is a wheat and a tare. And if you look it up, I mean, the wheat does, the tare looks like a wheat. Like you can't tell if I, if I go into the field, it looks like weeds. They, they all look the same. But you will see that there's a stalk where the wheat is coming from. If you brush it, it will break off, and you will see the tares is just a weed. But it all looks the same. And so in church, churches, that's what it does. Even though it has Christian on it, even though it says gospel-centered, even whatever the label is, it doesn't mean that it is. It might be tares, with the wheat and God in his sovereignty says, I, I'm going to allow that to happen so that it will show who is true and who is not in the end. And one sign of those that are not true will show when they leave. And they show that they are not of us and they will depart. But what that also implies that those, the distinguishing characteristics of those that are true will not go out. But they will stay to the truth of the gospel. Those that have been confirmed and affirmed by the gospel-centered followers from the early church until today. It's called orthodoxy. Sound doctrine. It sounds boring by that word, but what it means is over time it's the correct interpretation of what God has revealed in His word that over time has been affirmed throughout church history. That the gospel and His word are at the center. Unchanging throughout time timeless principles like the five solas, five statements that kind of capture in grace alone, that salvation is in grace alone. Sola gratia, that is a gift of grace. That it's by faith alone. It's nothing that you can do by work, by adding to it. It is by faith alone. In Christ alone. That, that payment was done on the atoning work of Christ and nothing and no one else. And it's based on His Word alone. Sola Scriptura, the inerrant, sufficient, divine revelation of God. And it's for His glory alone. Meaning God alone receives the glory in it, not man in turning to Him, but God calling sinners from death to life. These are time-tested Word-centered truths that preserve and affirm throughout church history. And, and, and what happens is they say, oh, that's the old school. That's the old way. There's something new. And I want you to just remember this phrase. If it's new, it's not true. And just be wary of the new. Because what God has preserved is what He has revealed in His Word. And so this is what he's talking about as here out of the church. And with this, I want to just take a note, take a pause here that the primary application to this is, is the false teachers and false leaders that are bringing this to bear. But I also want to, uh, I am, am aware that sometimes we use this as a way to reconcile with those that leave the faith. We often use this, uh, we have a friend that maybe was raised in church and say, oh, they were not of us. They leave because they were really not of us to begin with. They never were of the faith to begin with. And we have to be careful that we can't make an ultimate conclusion because we don't know the final outcome. We don't know if they're in a spirit of doubting or prodigal or just searching. But in the end, they will show in the end that they are of Christ. But what we do is we pray that they would return and remain in the faith. But if there's a pattern that shows the, that the direction and the, the, the um, kind of character is of the world, in the world, and for the world, then we must see the fruits of that life. But it doesn't stop us from casting them out. We must persist in prayer. We must continue in care and win them by the word and by our lives to Christ. 
So we have to be careful with seeing this, but what John is saying is that there is a, a, a work at hand in our churches in infiltrating, and just because it says it's of Christ does not mean it is. It may be anti-Christ in its way and in its manner. And for the last, the last part, how do, we, how do we respond to this? How do we know uh, what, what to do knowing the urgency in the last hour? So he, he turns and he says to, to the, 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 the readers here, he says in verse 20, But you, so in contrast to the Antichrist, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but, be, but because you do know it. And because no lie is of the truth. So what he, the, the context here, he say, you know, I, John's saying you can be seduced by the world's values. You can be deceived by the leaders within. Then how, how do we navigate this, these treacherous waters? How do we discern the truth from the false in this last hour? He says, you have the means to know the truth. You have the means. And the means is this anointing. And this, he says it in two things. You have this anointing and the knowledge. Anointing from the Holy One. And the word anointing here is that like, a, a, as the Old Testament talks about it, it's, it's a, a sign of appointment, a sign of setting apart for function and purpose. It's God's anointing on you, but it's not a special anointing for some and some others. It is for all believers. They receive this re anointing at the time of conversion. And it's not in addition but it's actually a habitation, an indwelling. And if you look down in verse 26, he talks about, uh, verse 26 and 27, he talks about what this anointing does. Verse 27 says, As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have not, no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it is taught you, you abide in him. So this anointing abides in you, teaches you, and brings you to the truth. And in John 14, it talks, Jesus talks about who this is. It's not just a special touching. It is actually the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. John 14, 26, it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. And bring to you your remembrance all that I said to you. He said, that this is who the anointing that you have. In verse, chapter 16, verse 13, it says, But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but wherever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He says, you have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will bring to you the truth. And, you will, and then you all know, he says, you all know, you all know the truth because the Holy Spirit will bring to mind what is revealed. And so this is what he's saying, this is how you navigate it. You'll be able to, spout, uh, to spot the counterfeit because why? Because you will know the authentic. You will know the genuine article and you can say that's counterfeit because as he's bringing the truth, you say that's not Hey, that doesn't follow what Jesus said. That's not in line with what is, is brought in in, in, in in the epistles. Because as you are in the Word and the Holy Spirit brings it to mind, you, you, it shows the deception. It shows the false, uh, the, 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 the pretense. And you won't be deceived. You won't be convinced. And you will see it as plain as day. So as you hear these new revelation, as you hear what is being taught and being heard even in sermons, and maybe even in sermons that you hear locally in different things, in different conferences perhaps, you got to ask yourself, does it line up? Does it line up with what the Word is revealing? And you, you have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. It's not because you're street smart or shrewd, it's because you have this sensitivity to the Holy Spirit's guidance. But a lot of times we don't have that because, one, we're not in God's Word. You know, we don't have it abiding in us. We don't read it. And so it, 
it becomes new material just like any other material because we don't have a reference point. And we don't have the sensitivity in, because there, what the Holy Spirit brings up, the well is very shallow. There's not much to bring up. And so that's where we are vulnerable. Or perhaps we are insensitive to the Holy Spirit because there's sin. Because sin grieves the Holy Spirit and desensitizes us to His guiding and His prompting. And if we ignore the calls for repentance, we will be callous to His counsel as well. So those are, th- those are ways that perhaps even though we are anointed in the Holy Spirit that we don't respond as we should and we can be easily deceived. So what it is reminding us to be in the Word and depend in prayer and to repent of sin and He will bring the truth to you. And the second part of this is that you will see the urgency of it in the time that this is the last hour, but then he t- goes further and talks about what they talk about, what their content, that the Antichrist themselves are liars. Verse 22, it says, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, The one who confesses the Son has the Father also, but as for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. So as we heard how you identify the Antichrist, you see that they depart from the fellowship, and here you'll see that they deny Jesus as the Christ. John asked this rhetorical question, who is the liar. Who is the one who speaks falsehood and deceives? And he says, they deny Jesus is the Christ. They are not in error about peripheral things. They are attacking the censor of the gospel. The Christ of Christianity. That Jesus is not the Christ. And what they're doing is they're lying about the person and work of Jesus. They're not denying that you need a Christ, and need a Savior. Christ means anointed one in terms of Savior. But they're denying that Jesus is that Savior. That Jesus is sufficient to save. What is, who is Jesus? Jesus is the name given that means God saves. It talks about the humanity of our Savior. That He walked this earth, He was... He was born in the incarnation, uh, in, the, in the virgin birth, in God among us, walking among us. He existed as a man. But also, we know that He is also God. So they accept that Jesus exists. That He walked and talked the earth, but He is not the Christ. They, what they are denying is that Jesus is not fully man and fully human, not holy God and holy man, that he is not the Christ promised. If you look in chapter 4, verse 2 to 3, he explains this further. 1 John 4, By this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming and is now, now it is already in the world. And just turn to the next book, 2 John, verse 7. It says this as well, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not, do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the Antichrist. What they accept, they say, hey, Jesus, yeah, he's human, but he's not God. He's not God in the flesh. And that's what they're saying, that Jesus did not come in the flesh. He was just a human. And there was a Gnostic view at the time that Jesus was born like any other man. You know, Jesus, Jesus, whatever. He's just a guy. His name was Jesus. And then there was this Christ spirit that at the baptism came upon him and descended on him and was with him until before his crucifixion. So that God did not die, and that Jesus did not live sinlessly, 
And so they didn't deny the incarnation of Christ, that God was in the flesh. And so when they do that, they lie about the person of Christ, that he is not both fully God and fully man. And therefore, if he's not fully God and fully man, then it invalidates what he did on the cross. That because he's not fully man, he cannot be the substitute, sinless substitute for humanity, for sinners. And if he's not fully God, then he, he cannot take on the wrath of God in our behalf. And therefore, secure us for eternity. Because the payment itself is incomplete. And so what they say is, Jesus is not enough to save. You need more. You need more works, more knowledge, more revelation, more prayers. And therefore, this is what we give you. And so they deny the divinity of Christ. And this is going on today. We know that Judaism... They say that Jesus is an influential teacher, but he's not the Messiah. We know Islam saying Jesus is the prophet, but the Messiah, but he's not the Son of God. Jehovah Witness saying that Jesus was not God, but a God, because they changed Scripture. I mean, it's happening around us. You may have friends that say, hey, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Jesus. And it just further nuance, I don't know if you know, but there's, a, there's a, a feeling that many believers are deconstructing towards the teachings of Richard Rohr that say that Jesus is not just the Christ, he's a Christ. That there's this universal cosmic Christ. That, you know, Jesus is just one manifestation of it, but Christ is all around us. We can just connect to it. Your dog may be your savior. Your, 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 you know, your, your, your job may be your savior. Whatever it is, just... Allowing you to connect to Christ in all these different expressions. You can do it through Buddhism. You can do it through meditation. You're just connecting to Christ, man. And the cross, on the cross, it was not the wrath of God poured on on me. It's just a symbolic expression of love that shows the Christ. I mean, this is the teaching, if you look on TikTok, that people are just deconstructing towards. They say that, yeah, you know, Christianity is too restrictive, but this kind of, I, I now understand the, the universality of Jesus, of, of Christ. And it's an invitation, and there's all these ways to God, just as long as you connect to it. And if you bring further nuance to this, you can say that when you say Christ is not enough, we see that also maybe in Catholicism, where you don't have enough, just Christ alone you need sacraments. You need more grace. You know, once you get baptized, you get that, that justification uh, uh, with right with God. But as you sin throughout life, you have to erase that sin by confession. You have to, you have to gain more grace through, through, through communion, through, through, uh, con uh, um, through confirmation, through good works, even through marriage act itself, through the prayer of the saints. You gain more grace. And at the end, if you have... You're, you have more grace than your sin, then you go into purgatory where it will purge you of the stain of sin. But you see that it's not, Christ is not enough. That Jesus is not enough. And so that what you are, you're denying that Jesus is not the only Christ. There is the Christ and plus other things. There is a Christ but not Jesus as the Christ. But then you may hear your friends and yourself may say, you know, I believe in God, man. I believe that there's a higher power. But I don't think Jesus is the only way. And what John would say to that is, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. If you say that you deny the Son, that you don't know God, that you don't believe in God at all, because why? Because they are one in the Trinity. In John 10, 30, it's how Jesus says explicitly, I and the Father are one. And Philip asked him, you know, one of the disciples saying, hey, show us the Father. And he said, what are you talking about? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And when the Son says, there is only one way to the Father and no other name. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. The Father affirms the Son and says, and the baptism, you are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. He said, God is saying, Jesus is the only way to me. 
You want to know me? You want to know God the Father? Then you come through Christ. Because I sent him, and I, I am pleased with him, and he is the way to me. Therefore, if you reject the Son, you reject the Father. You reject the, the Father's affirmation of the Son. And not, when, when, you, when you reject the Son, what you are calling into question is the character of God. You're saying that God is a liar then. God is a lie, lying about His Son, is imperfect and unfaithful to His Word. And John says this in chapter 5, verse 9 to 10. Let's turn to the end of this book. Um, verse 9 to 10, it, talks, it says this in more explicit terms. 1 John 5, 9 to 10. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that He has testified concerning His Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has a testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. So when you, de when you deny Jesus, you do not just deny Jesus alone. You deny God, the Father, because you say the Father affirmed him. And you're saying that he's lying? You're calling to question his character and also his plan of salvation through his son. And then that's what you're doing. So you can't just say, I, I, I believe in a higher power, but I don't accept Jesus. No, then you don't believe in God. You don't have God. You're outside of fellowship with him. And in the end, you will realize that those who confess the son, they have the father. The word confess here is to, to say with agreement, to say in the same way that says that Christ is the only way. In Christ, I confess the Father's affirmation about the Son. I, I affirm the plan of redemption through the Son, and I come through the Son to the Father so I can know Him. And so we hear this common phrase, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I believe in the man upstairs in the higher power, but I don't believe Jesus is the only way. And some of us may hold to that currently. And I would say to you and ask you to think about why is the exclusivity, why is Jesus so offensive? Because if you believe in God and you say, I believe in God, then if God were to be God, then he can determine the way in which to come to him. And he determines by his own will. And if he determines in his plan of salvation to come through means of His Son, who are we to say, that doesn't jive with me. That's too exclusive. That's too limiting. Then we become the God that determines how to come to God. But you have to realize not just the exclusivity of Christ, but what He did, but that He did all the work for you to come to God. He did all of it. He paid it all for sinners like you and I to be reconciled. He didn't re require us to, to, to be perfect. He says, I will take you as a broken sinner in deadness, call you to myself, pay the price. While you, you we were yet sinners, he would die for, for us. As a free gift out of his gracious heart, invite us in all you do to receive him to receive is acknowledge your sin. Acknowledge your depravity for a holy God. See, surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Turn and submit to Him. And receive what He has done and paved the way for you so that you can know your Creator. Do you want to know God? Do you want to know and be right with God the Father? You can know Him through Jesus Christ. And you have not received Him today. Receive Him as He has made the way for you to know Him. Confess Him. Confess Him as your Savior, as the Christ, as your Lord, so that you may know and have the Son, uh, have the Father as well, and be in communion with God. Because He made the way. He was God in the flesh, fully God, come in the flesh to dwell and live a sinless life, because no human could bear the weight of and full wrath of of, of sin upon him except for God himself but he was also fully man to be 
to understand what we un go through, to be our high priest, and to face all the temptation of sin, but yet without sinning, and to die as a man and be resurrected in victory over death, to be the mediator between God and man. That is all that Jesus did for us. And so we receive Him. We receive the Father. But if we deny Him, we lie about His power, His plan, His character, and the plan of God. So how do we function? He, and Jesus, uh, John turns to say, just like He said before, in the urgency in this last hour, you are anointed. He says, you need to abide. He says, as for you, if you look at the last verses here, he says, verse 24, As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also will abide in the Son and in the Father. So if you kind of can appreciate what John is saying, you, you say, okay, John, I get you. You're telling that the Antichrists are here. They're all around us. They're in the churches. Their teachings are deceptive. They're meant to mislead. They're preaching another gospel, a false gospel, the gospel that does not save. So how do we guard ourselves from this inundation of deception, these cunning attacks? How do we navigate this to be able to see through it? He says, get back to the gospel. Go back to the basics. Go back to the beginning. He says, go back to the beginning of your faith. He says, what did you hear? What did you receive? He says, go back, uh, what, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. What did you hear? Go back to the beginning of this book, chapter 1. And he talks about that. What do we hear from the beginning? What was from the beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Go back to the gospel. The gospel that it is in Jesus Christ as revealed in His Word. The gospel that we have seen and touched in humanity in the flesh. And, and we, we, can, we say about Him concerning the Word of the, the Word of the life and we proclaim it to you. Go back to that. And a lot of times we think about the gospel as, you know, just the ABCs of our faith. That's level one. And then I have graduated to beyond, you know, now I'm at level 10, whatever it is. No, the gospel is not elementary. It is central. It is what revolves, everything that revolves around is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we must come back to it and not allow it just to be something we knew at one time or we could recite it to somebody else if we needed to share it. No, it, it abides in you. What, what do you think about you? when you live with somebody? They know you and it, 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 they're about you and, and they influence how you are. It's what it's like. It makes its home in you, in your mind, in your heart. It lets you direct your thoughts, your decision, and your life. You meditate on it day and night. Just go through the, 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 the five solas. If you, if you really think about that you are saved by grace alone, that nothing I can do, deserve, or earn this, then you would, you would live a life of gratitude, wouldn't you? Of thankfulness. You say, you know what? I don't even deserve to, to come and worship. Then you come with thanksgiving and come and say, who am I to stand before you? If you knew that you were saved through Christ alone, through the sacrificial love and substitution of Christ, uh, that He did for you, then you would honor Him, you would love Him and adore Him. Saying, thank you for, for, for being the way for me that I can come to God. And if you, were, if you realize that you are saved by faith alone, that all you had to do is trust in the finished work, then you can trust that He's not done sanctifying you. That He will finish that work too. And that He's not just done with you, but He's done with the sinners around you that are broken just like you. And that He's doing His sanctifying work in them and in your church that is so messed up and broken too. And that you cannot just trust in Him having faith in what He's done on the cross, but you say faith in the promises that He made that when you obey Him, you, when you repent, you will experience the freedom in Him. 
And if you meditate on what it means to, be, to, re, to know that it's revealed in the Word alone, sola scriptura, then you will cling to it. You will breathe it in. You will listen to it. You'll, you'll allow it to still your heart and mind, not just something you, you do on a Sunday morning on your app, but you take every opportunity to hear it taught, to respond to its instruction, to, to hear it sink and marinate in it. And if you remember that it's for His glory alone, then you won't have a priority of a, just a comfortable life of blessing, of abundance. You want, how, how can I make your name be heard? How can I live it out? Who has not heard this yet? But what, the reason why we're vulnerable, and John is, is, is bringing this to the, 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 the church, the first church, and why God is bringing it to us, we're vulnerable, is because we forget and neglect the gospel. It becomes commonplace to us. It becomes facts on a page. It's just cognitive, but not conviction. It's knowledge, but not experience. We must come and marinate in it and think about it and, and come in it and say, this is who I am. This is how I come in Christ alone, saved by grace alone, by faith alone, in His Word alone, for His glory alone. And if we do that, then our hearts will sing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, Jesus, what can I bring to such faithful a friend to so loving a king? We would sing that and say, you know, my soul must sing to the beautiful one. But the reason why we don't do that, the reason why we, are so, we could be so vulnerable to these teachings that say there's more, there's more that you have to do, there's, that Jesus isn't the only way, is because we have strayed from keeping ourselves anchored in the gospel. But what happens? What happens when you immerse yourself in the gospel? What happens when you return to it and let it anchor you? It says here, it says, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. You will have a deeper communion and fellowship with Him, with the Son and the Father, the Trinity. That not just the gospel will abide in you, but the, you will abide in the God of the gospel. You will walk in the light as He is in the light. You will have fellowship with Him and then with one another. You, and as you are in the light, you will love one another like He talked about earlier. And then if you abide in Him, you will have the strength to overcome the evil one. And then, guess what? The love of the world will have no pull on you because it pales in comparison for the love of God for you. And the lies of the Antichrist are just exposed there because the Holy Spirit has, is anointing will lead you and bring you to the truth of the gospel and say, no, there is no one else. It is in no other name but Jesus. You don't need to add anything else. It is only in, Christ, in grace alone. And the, these deceptive doctrines will be exposed and the traps will be laid bare right before you and you can see right through it because the, you abide in the gospel and the gospel abides in you. And this is how we, we live in this last hour. This is how we, we function as the clock is ticking. He says, children, this is the last hour. As, as, as the seduction is from without and the infiltration is from within, we don't have to live in fear because he says, but you have an anointing. You have the Holy Spirit. And you let it abide in you. Think of the anointing that you have and abide in the gospel. And whatever time is remaining, then you'll be able to persevere to the end. And when that clock, when your time is up, and you are found to be anointed and abiding, you will enter the joy of your Master, who was and is the Lord even before time began, and will be Lord even when time ends. This is the last hour. How will you live in this last hour? Are you anointed in Him? Are you abiding in Him? Live as if it's your last hour, because it is. Let us stand and pray.
Lord God, we just come before you and we thank you for your word. Many of us, Lord, we, we're not aware and we don't see the seriousness and the perils of which we live in. We often just are naive to the power and the seduction of the world. We're naive that we can just go through life on our own, disconnected from your word, insensitive to your spirit, and think we can survive. Hey, Lord, you have equipped us, equipped us with the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. You have given us the weapons of warfare to not just defend, but to go into this world and win souls to you, Lord. Pray that you would help us to see the urgency to abide in you, to live in you, and to remain in you, Lord. Thank you. Pray all these things in your name. Amen.